Good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Carl Nightingale. I am one of the coordinators with Nicholas Lustig, who's up here chawing on his uh, popcorn <laughs> of the uh, City and Society Workshop. <laughs> uh, and Nicholas is in geography. I'm in uh, transnational studies. I teach world history and urban history up there. I have for many years, anyway. And um, it gives me a, a really great pleasure to, um, to uh, introduce you to Professor Sarah Lopez. And there's a lot of reasons for this, this pleasure. Uh, one, of them, uh, one, of, one of the reasons is that when I met her in a certain uh, university town in New Jersey uh, that many academics think of as kind of a culminating destination, maybe you know what I'm talking about, her first words were that I should plan on having guests up in Buffalo because she was determined to re rent an RV and bring her whole family up here for summer <laughs> vacation. Um, she had just read about our interesting built environment um, around uh, uh, immigration and uh, refugees, and so she wanted to see it for um, herself. Um, she, she knows wisely that Buffalo had become uh, an important place to many people who are engaged in very important acts that in many ways define our times uh, in world history, and she wanted to see the setting uh, for those stories. Um, these settings, the built environments, the fixed yet changing, sometimes moving places that people in motion used to make motion possible have been the focus for Professor Lopez's life's work as an architectural historian, and tonight she'll explain why those settings are important. Professor Lopez, I am very happy to announce, has been freshly promoted to Associate Professor of Architectural History at the School of Architecture at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, she is the author of the book, The Remittance Landscape, Spaces of Migration in Rural Mexico and the Urban USA, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2015. It's a revision of her dissertation at the University of California, Berkeley in 2011. And it's a recipient of the 2017 Spiro Kostov Award for a book that makes the greatest contribution to our understanding of the growth and development of cities during that year. Um, she has won fellowships to work at the Bancroft Library, the University of Chicago, the New School for Social Research, and the Mellon Center for Architectural Urbanism and the Humanities, which uh, is uh, in Princeton, and that's when she told me about her plans to come to Buffalo. Um, she's won many other awards for research and teaching and community service. Her recent uh, published and ongoing work focuses on the all-important issue of immigrant detention and incarceration. This is the subject of her talk today. You can read the title up there. Um, and uh, just before um, asking us to welcome Sarah, just let me also thank my colleagues in the City and Society Workshop of, uh, again, the UB Humanities Institute, especially Nicholas, who's here, uh, Victoria Wolcott, Sharmista Bagshishan, uh, Chris Mele, for all their committed interest in, uh, and collaboration in the workshop. Some of the workshop's best moments are the events like this when we collaborated with our colleagues here at the School of Architecture and Planning. Thanks so much to Julia Jemrozik, Joyce Wong, uh, Holly Cook, and Omar Khan for everything you've done to make this and other co-sponsors events possible. I hope this provides uh, some small inspiration for future collaborations between CAS and ANP as we collectively uh, you know, offer a huge storehouse of knowledge about the built environment to our students and to our city. That said, uh, that said, this evening is devoted above all to the exciting work of Sarah Lopez. Um, the RV idea had to be scrapped in favor of a jet plane, and the date got put off a bit, but here she is. Uh, please join me in welcoming her to this, her dream destination, the city of Buffalo, <laughs> New York. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. I, yeah, I have. By the way, I did make it into the RV. Um, so minor correction, but we but Carl was out of town, so we couldn't come to Buffalo at the time. Um, thank you so much for having me here. It's really exciting for me to be able to uh, share this work with you. I'm mostly talking about a piece of the research that I'm doing on the architectural history of immigrant detention and immigrant incarceration um, in Texas. Um, I'm going to focus today on from the 1960s to the present, and this is very much not only a work in progress, but I'm not sure yet, I'm figuring out the trajectory of how this fits into a larger book project. It's one of the two that I'm working on, and so I'd love to have, you know, in our discussion, um, some 
hints or, or, or ideas from you about what aspects of this topic you find most interesting and where you'd like to see me develop or push ideas further. Um, as uh, Carl was saying, my previous research has focused on the remittance landscape. This is the photograph that I use um, that became the cover of the book. Uh, he already told you the title, but the reason that I wanted to bring the title up is because one of the important aspects of my work has been that it has been multi-sided. So it's work that takes place both you know, in Mexico and in US cities and talking about, through a comparative lens, how migration knits these two places and multiple places, many more places together. But it's also very much about understanding how the money that migrants earn in the United States in different US cities and send to Mexican hometowns, and then that money being used to build something, is creating a very aspirational landscape. Whether it's a landscape or homes, the remittance house is what you know, I've been calling it, that is meant for retirement or for some future date, or whether it's a home to return to, or whether it's a home for one's family, if one's family is fragmented across you know, disparate geographies. These are a couple examples of, of homes that migrants have built with dollars in the United States. Again, very aspirational landscapes. So I'm putting here an image of a remittance house next to a detention center, um, because today I'm not obviously talking about my previous project. I'm focusing on another space of migration. I'm turning away from the aspirational home to a punitive uh, state space of immigration enforcement, for many a closing down of future possibilities. And in many ways, the juxtaposition of these two images begs the question, where is the better future that migrants seek? The project that I'm talking about today began in 2015 for me as a collaborative student uh, project that I did with my students. We were creating representations to render the Texas detention uh, sort of landscape visible to a broader audience. And this is the website. It is a part of States of Incarceration, which is a, you know, 20 professors in 20 different universities were all doing projects in concert. Um, and so my students put together um, a, a web exhibit on the Texas infrastructure of detention. And this is an image. <coughs> this is me camouflaging as a young student there with, with my students. Um, we were here rushed off the site by private security, um, yet this image was in 2015. This was in a different time. This was a time while deportations and detentions were high under Obama, but it was before zero tolerance. Today there are still an unknown number of children who have not been re reunited with their parents. It was before the US government compiled information about journalists that reported on the 2018 caravan and singled them out for secondary screenings when they tried to re-enter Mexico. It was before migrant act activists like Rag Ravi Ragber were targeted for deportation as means to fragmenting solidarity and resistance amongst organizers. It, be it was before there was a considerable rise in ICE arrests in sanctuary spaces, public spaces, and places of business what activists referred to as a new reign of terror, and the list goes on and on. So in this time, in the last two years, we, those of us, many of us who are reading um, very you know, disparate but credible news sources, have all become educated about the migrant detention system. We've been seeing images like this. Some of us have family and friends that are affected by these policies and practices. So in many ways, for me, talking about this issue now in 2019 is very different than it was in 2015 and 2016 when I started this project. And I'm struggling both intellectually and emotionally how to kind of respond to delivering and thinking through um, a historical set of circumstances in, in the current um, political material and embodied climate. So, with this in mind, I want to lay out questions that have guided my investigation so far, and as I said before, seek your input on what feels most or more relevant. Um, the questions being, and kind of a, the, at different scales, what is the history of the Texas, the Texas deten detention infrastructure? Uh, simply, just what is it? How does the architecture of migrant detention both reflect and constitute the changing attitudes and policies of the state toward immigrants? How does the concrete form of detention facilities fix the abstract and ambiguous position of foreign subjects? And what are the long-term ethical, social, and political implications of this detention architecture? How does architecture punish? And I think that actually we could have a fruitful debate about if architecture can punish. I have been, people have debated against the phrasing of this question. 
what is the role in design, uh, of design and construction in immigration policy and enforcement. Tracking the evolution um, of the Texas, the Texas detention infrastructure from the 1960s, when Texas had two publicly owned and managed detention centers, to the present, I argue that the construction and detention of facilities has formalized and institutionalized the, quote, penal turn and, quote, criminalization of migration reflected in immigration policy into an intractable material reality with long-term consequences. Even more importantly than this, I argue that we must look at the buildings, their history, their embedded systems and meanings, to actually understand how US immigration policy works, its logic. Buildings matter. Buildings and the building industry influence how we legislate and manage migrant populations. They are not merely the outcome of immigration policy. So when I first started trying to think this project through, I asked, what is a detention center? Um, in many ways, we think of Ellis Island as a gateway, but it's a funnel, a historic funnel, where people were moved through to resettle into the United States, but also detained and deported from. Um, interestingly, in architectural record here in 1902, you have this quote about Ellis Island, what a great thing it is, not only for America, but for humanity, that there should be so vast an asylum, or rather arena, open for the crowded out, the residuum of other lands. It is just the reverse of Dante's famous line, abandon all hope, ye who enter. It's an aesthetic requirement that this lavish hospitality and worldwide welcome should be expressed, and expressed in the architecture. So it's a very inter interesting position here, um, from architectural record in terms of what it means to build a civic monumental structure that is supposed to be this gateway, this moment of arrival. Of course, in you know, the historic analysis that people have done um, of, of Ellis Island, migrants didn't necessarily experience it that way. They referred to Ellis Island as, quote, an island of tears. Um, different people recall harsh greetings, quote, get on upstairs, you cattle, you'll soon have a nice little pen. Men were mixed with women, common rooms uh, contained horrid smells, vermin, long wait times, abject treatment. Nonetheless, the architecture was civic, big, monumental, urban, in terms of its proximity to New York City, visible. It was very characteristic of that period. What a detention center is also has to be answered in terms of this piece of legislation. This is the Geary Act here in the 1890s. It was an extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and it forced Chinese laborers to carry internal resident permits at the time. Failure to do so would lead to deportation and detention. At the time it was established, it was challenged on constitutional grounds. And Kelly Lyle Hernandez, who's a historian, has written an excellent book, um, and she analyzed congressional cases where justices argued that to forcibly remove persons from the US inflicted undue harm and violated their rights to formal criminal proceedings, among other things. On the contrary, the counter argument went, detention and deportation is not punitive, it's not punishment, it's merely an administrative process. So the rights and punishments associated with criminal prosecution do not apply necessarily to migrants, so the argument went. What this means, Hernandez, argues is that while unlawful residence of Chinese in the US was technically decriminalized, it was done so in order to allow for their incarceration and removal. So it's actually a bit of an important piece of legislation that has carried over from the 1890s to the current day. So this is a quote from the 1890s from the Supreme Court. De deportation is not punishment for a crime. Detention is not imprisonment in a legal sense. And the quote you have below is from 2009. And this is actually written, uh, this, this Dr. Shiro is uh, a former employee of ICE. And she was doing an audit as an ICE employee, as Immigration and Customs Enforcement employee. She was doing an audit of ICE detention and deportation uh, practices and writes, immigration proceedings and civil proceedings and immigrant detention is not punishment. And at the time, she was writing about the mismatch between their own landscape um, and what the actual legal proceedings are supposed to look like. Yet we have a strikingly punitive infrastructure of detention. So the question is, can people be imprisoned 
not, can people not be imprisoned legally, but be imprisoned physically? Can buildings themselves define the nature of or force of punishment? Texas is a really great place to address these questions because in Texas, we incarcerate more non-citizens than any other state in the union. So this map is from 2015 and it's now out of date because since then some facilities have closed, others have opened and we're also under uh, uh, the process of expansion. In 1970, Texas had the capacity to detain approximately 15, and these are really rough approximations, 1,500 migrants. Today, Texas can detain and incarcerate. So this is actually clustering different um, modes of detention and incarceration together, uh, approximately 30,000 migrants daily. What a detention center is, is also complicated by who is detained and by the distinction between detention centers and immigration prisons, which I just alluded to. An estimated half of those detained in detention centers in Texas are asylum seekers from over 200 countries. So since I started this research in 2015, I've met people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Eritrea, Sudan, Cameroon, Iraq, the Central African Republic, and the list goes on. Many of whom are fleeing political, social, and religious persecution. Um, those uh, who, and many who are asylum seekers in the, in the process of awaiting trial. Immigration prisons are different. They are not detention centers and they are not the focus of this talk, but I mention them and I include them in the overall count because they also incarcerate migrants for re-entry. So unauthorized entry through boundaries, US-Mexico boundary is the one most on my mind, um, although <laughs> not today. Um, uh, unauthorized entry is a felony and re-entry, unauthorized re-entry is, is a misdemeanor. Other way around. Unauthorized entry first time is a misdemeanor and re-entry is a felony. So if you are caught re-entering, you can get up to two years in a criminal alien requirement facility or a car facility, which is what is the immigration prison. Those are run by the Bureau of Prisons, BOP, not by ICE. So it is two different systems. And yet it is persons who are migrants who are mobilizing for a variety of reasons who can get caught up in both systems. And we can talk about that and tease that out if you have more questions about that later. Um, two continuously operating facilities in Texas today date to the 1960s. And you can see them here, uh, Port Isabel down here and El Paso right up here. This is Mexico and this is water, right? So you can see here that this is, these are the two facilities I'm talking about are there at the, at the boundary line. Um, the one in El Paso has a really fascinating history that I'm still sort of in the process of uncovering. As far as I can tell, it dates to the 1930s, but I've only been able to find archival architectural evidence of the 1955 facility in El Paso. This was a temporary facility. Um, and you can see here that there are barracks, there is a warehouse here, a processing office, um, and it was, you know, on the, obviously, U.S. side of the boundary line. I've also been able to find in the archives descriptions of what some of those buildings were in that 1955 facility. Um, so you see here mess hall, one-story steel structure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this building, 29.7, delousing building constructed of brick, right? Delousing, as in sort of that meta, uh, literal delousing of a person's uh, body and belongings, um, et cetera. Detailed description both of the materials and the programmatic function of the buildings. The archives also contain images. So the building that we just saw, the, the, that we just read about, the delousing house is here pictured. Um, with persons in the front, and you can get a sense of what, what the barracks looked like on the site. It was a temporary facility, and in the 1960s is when the more permanent facility was built, and when that detention center was expanded in El Paso. So that happens here um, with U.S. detention facility, almost like army camp, detainees amazed at fine treatment. The Director of Immigration and Naturalization Services at the time, which was the bureaucracy that preceded ICE, notes, the camp was built as inconspicuous as it could be. The absence of watchtowers and strict confinement measures are designed to make life easier to the deportee while in facility. People are detained, people, 
The people detained here are not violent criminals. They're merely charged with being illegally in the U.S. and are awaiting investigation before being returned to Mexico or whatever country they are from. Again, in the archives, you find images. So this is the mess hall. This is persons um, eating in the mess hall in the El Paso facility. Note the windows. And then here you see dormitory. This was a space made out of concrete, cinder block, and brick housed up to 192 men each, um, a, separate set, a separate room for wash basins and the latrines. And I'll come back to these images later. The second oldest continuously operating facility in Texas. So it's the second one that we have, and it's a public facility, publicly a ICE run and managed facility, is the Port Isabel Service Processing Center. It was built on an abandoned naval base 30 miles northeast of Brownsville. And again, at the time, the Attorney General notes, the border situation is combined at Port Isabel as in no other place. Here, drug smuggling and human migrants could be intercepted and repatriations performed. And the archives have fascinating little pieces of evidence like this one, um, the Naval Aux Auxiliary Air Station, which then was given over to the Immigration and Naturalization Services, right? So all of the pink area there cordoned off and part of a transfer in terms of who and how the facility was going to be managed as it turned into a an, uh, an ICE, uh, not ICE, an INS facility. And with the transfer from the naval base to INS came detailed information on contracts and bids for contracts. So again, in the archive, you can find um, how exactly the specifications were supposed to be for what kinds of remodeling and renovations were supposed to happen on the facilities um, in that new INS uh, Border Patrol Academy, including labor rates, um, including painting color, including masonry detail, et cetera. Uh, separate mess hall, here you see uh, the recreational area outdoors with men under a shed roof, and you see the fence in the background. Now, this facility did expand. It expanded in 1989 temporarily with tent-like structures. Uh, Lloyd and Mounts, which are two geographers, wrote an excellent new book, Boats, Borders, and Bases, and they explore historic events, political crises, and policy shifts that occur in the 1980s and beyond that help to ex explain the initial expansion of the detention system. But at this time, the Mariel Cuban boat crisis, the Haitian refugee crisis, and the spurring of refugee law of 1980 made it so that anybody fleeing oppressive regimes could apply for asylum. And so in the 1980s, at Port Isabel, there was a flood of persons who were coming, and the erection of these temporary tents was in response to that. So these older facilities that I'm showing you have for them a couple of lessons for us to think about as we think about the newer construction. Port Isabel and El Paso detention centers were, and still are, government-owned and managed facilities whose material histories correspond with a logic of migration. El Paso is an important place for migrant crossing along the U.S.-Mexico divide, and Port Isabel is strategically located to address maritime and land migrations. Also, the expansion that I just showed you at Port Isabel was related to historic events that changed migratory dynamics. Another important thing for us to think about is the scale. Um, El Paso had under 1,000 persons um, that were able to be detained, around 600. And Port Isabel, as well, was between 400 and 600 persons in terms of the capacity before the tents. And finally, just the mere fact of having access to archival information about these places alone distinguishes some of these centers from what is to come. These factors change in the 1980s when, barring city and county jails, private corporations assume the development of our detention landscape using a distinctly market logic, not a migration logic, that does not rely on migrant routes, long-term immigration trends like the Bracero program, or major historic events as the basis for decisions about how and where to build. In 1984, Corrections Corporation of America, which is now Core Civic, um, built one of the first private detention facilities in the country, in Houston, and you're looking here at just a Google Earth aerial view of that facility, which is notedly urban and which had a capacity for 350 persons. After their first private prison in a big city, they started to look for sites in West, West Texas and other rural locations. Prison prospectors, which is what they're called, 
promised counties suffering from declining agriculture and oil industries that prisons would provide economic benefits without seasonal changes, incoming jobs, and handsome prof profits. And prison prospectors promised that today. Eventually, counties began to compete for such opportunities by donating land, upgrading sewer systems, or offering property and tax abatements. All facilities since then, all, that I have been able to identify or that is listed in the ICE facilities documents um, have been built in Texas on average 105 miles from the nearest city with pro bono legal services. Since the 1990s, five immigration prisons, so of the CAR facilities, are stamped out of agricultural land that is approximately 204 miles from the nearest city with a population of 300,000 or more. This very much matters as Mounts and others argue Quote, there's a geography to rights and access, and geography is used to keep migrants from exercising rights and accessing particular resources. It's remarkable that private prison corporations are building our detention system. We must compare the numbers. Only 15% of the US prison system is privately owned and managed. Over 70% of the immigrant detention system is owned and managed by approximately five companies. And in Texas, that number is much higher. Um, it's remarkable that they're building our detention infrastructure because they have an outsized control and influence over the design process and even, in some cases, congressional action, it seems, regarding immigration. This impossible to read map um, <laughs> is supposed to basically just illustrate one point. Here you have various acts, events, legislation. Um, so for example, there was a very important piece of policy in 1996 in the Clinton era known as IRA-IRA, um, which expanded the number of persons that were able to be detained um, and deported and really shifted the dynamics of, of detention and deportation. Post 9-11, of course, we have Homeland Security um, and the birth of ICE, and we have new funding streams and increased funding streams for, for ICE. But importantly, um, Geo Group and CoreCivic and other prison corporations start to increasingly lobby. And this is tracked by activists, Detention Watch Network. There's a whole series of, of um, activists and le legal advocates who are doing work on this topic. But they've been uh, increasingly lobbying since about 2004, 2005. And right around that time, so it's this period right here, is also when you start to get congressional action with what they call the bed quota. Um, which is a, a specific number of dollars that are designated for detention beds annually. And what it shows you here is the footprint buildup of the facilities alongside these kind of political policy and economic changes. There's a little bit more mobility with, even though policy is intractable in many ways, with mobility and economic change, things can administratively shift, policy can change. How does that work? How does that mobility work with the built environment? What are the inertias that are attached to the building up of the infrastructure of detention? How easily can this accumulation of footprints of detention centers be undone, right? Um, so, To think a little bit more about the specifics of, of the architecture of detention and what it means to now have you know, that landscape, that, that sort of increase, um, which is now a, a, a veritable system of detention that we have in Texas, I examine the role that architects and construction firms have played in that building boom, really that boom that we saw in the 2005 to, to 2010 um, um, period. What design ideas and ideals are codified in the landscape of detention? How does des a design punish? We already asked that. How does design influence subjective e experience? A critical source for thinking about this is the Justice Facilities Review. Uh, they are an AIA publication that publishes courthouse, police stations, <coughs> prisons. The review jury is comprised of a professional architect, um, officers from the correctional field, and a judge. So it's three persons that, that sit on the jury. And it's interesting to just note their discussion around prisons more generally, um, some of which are detention centers, but they don't specify if it's a detention center for migrants or not. 
What we see, though, is that there is a retrenchment in the architectural field in this wider discussion about producing and designing prisons. Um, 27 projects were highlighted in the 1998-99 issue, and that number increasingly declines. And by the time we get to 2015, one project that is a prison was discussed in, in this particular uh, journal. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, the JFR juries discussed a trend toward decreasing designing increasingly, quote, non-normative environments. Non-normative environments, also referred to by them as the hardening of facilities, were described as relying on small dark cells, caged recreational spaces, and this is something that we can compare when we see this image to that image I showed you of, of El Paso, where it was a shed roof and it was an outdoor space with a fence in the background. That is a space where people go outside collectively. What you have today in a lot of detention centers is this. Um, this is the outdoor space, which is attached to the room on the other side. So you can see here up above a kind of clear story, um, which has the uh, you know, fencing and then the fence outside. And this counts because there are stipulations you know, as to how many days outside, days, um, hours outside a person is supposed to have a day, et cetera, like that. So this counts as outdoor time. An absence of natural light, uh, again, described by the jury, increasingly replaced by, quote, borrowed light, where skylights and clear stories are used to channel indirect light in lieu of windows. So for, again, when I showed you those images of the historic facilities, just it's notable that there were even windows, right? In the current facilities, there aren't, windows are not being used in the facilities except for in the officer's offices. Harsh fluorescent lighting, increased use of concrete floors, crude signage. Um, another major thing they discussed was minimal person-to-person -person contact achieved by an increasing reliance on, quote, indirect supervision concept, so video visitation, and non-overlapping circulation spaces. Today, indirect supervision through the use of vi video monitoring and one-way glass, as well as facilities designed for minimal employee circulation, strips inmates, of course, of continuous human contact and can contribute to their sense that they're always being watched, it's that panoptic thing, while feeling interminably isolated. So these are quotes from the jury. Feelings were that once a facility is toughened, there may be no going back. It's difficult to rescind philosophical and architectural decisions. The behavior of those confined and the response of those who operate these facilities will be directly influenced by the built environment, right? Also, they were thinking about the employees. How are the employees, not just the detainees, going to be influenced by these changes in design? Our corrections and detention systems are racing to keep pace with an ever-increasing demand. The use of prototypical designs is a major trend. Once again, we ask, can we really afford to continue to solve our problems by building more beds? And this was a cry in 1999, right before that map I showed you where all of the facilities quickly, one after the other, year by year, um, were erected. The retrenchment is mirrored by the rise, of course, also of the private prison corporation. These corporations don't merely manage detention and provide security. Since at least 1992, Geo Group has housed a design-build component into their corporate structure, which means that in-house designers and construction companies oversee the building from start to finish. They also oversee the long-term management of facilities. This gives the private prison company, I mean, this is like an architect's dream, right? This is, this is total control in many ways of, of many aspects of um, the finished product. These corporations sometimes contract with construction companies or innovate in-house. Innovations are primarily aimed at facilitating rural construction. And you have to think about how a lack of expert labor like engineers and manual and construction labor is difficult on these remote sites, on these more rural locations. So sometimes there's been a discussion about how to build you know, in urban warehouses and ship. Um, there's also been a discussion about minimizing cost uh, through reduction in staff. Right? Staffing is one fact, factor that may be addressed by design. So if architects, or if the, ar the architect has receded and the corporation and the construction companies are assuming the mantle, the question also becomes what's, ICE, what's ICE's role um, in design? In 2007, ICE published this, which is actually available online, Design Standards Manual, with information about ICE's quote, organizational, operational, and functional requirements. 
and it's filled with detailed specifications for ICE employees and, quote, other governmental agents. And so you flip through this design standards, and I was actually very excited because I started realizing that ICE was very transparent um, you know, about what their details were going to be in terms of their requirements for detainee, uh, for the detention center in, in general, but for the specifics of the deta detainee's daily life. So you see things like this, officer in charge um, with his room spec'd out, including you know, where the furniture goes, um, and I just, these are there they very much adhere to this to the to the requirements uh, described in in these plans and as I got to page 200 and something I finally came to the detainee housing section section 3.8 um, and realized that housing which is you know the most important programmatic function of the detention center was in red because that is contractor space detailed so there was actually no information um, in terms of in this kind of design manual of what the specifics of the housing quarters needed to be. It was simply not available. Um, since the design of detainee living quarters is the contractor's responsibility, we know little about them. The corporation will very clearly not share plans or participate in interviews. Um, the detention centers are allowed, we're, it's our right uh, as, as citizens to tour detention facilities. Any of you at any time can call up, can contact a detention center and say you want a tour. It's your taxpayer dollars. Um, and there is a formal process we're supposed to be able to go through to do that. Um, however, many people that I know who work with migrants, who are legal advocates, have been quote unquote blacklisted and, and unable to get tours. I myself have been kind of in a waiting line to get a tour. I actually tried to go tour Dilly and was not told no. I just was also not told yes. And I still have not toured Dilly. Um, I've also requested Freedom of Information Act requests that have been denied. Um, and some of the information that I have found already on their library has been really useful to me in lieu of that. In that ICE design standards manual that I showed you, there is one plan, which is this one. Pearsall, Texas. It's a town of 9,000 persons. So in this one plan, which is their kind of illustrated, you know, their, their one example of, of a detention center, and then from that they kind of talk about the different rooms and the different aspects of the center, we can see how classification and categorization are used to organize orderly spaces of punishment. In plan, the Western Mass has female and juvenile dorms and juvenile processing, and the Eastern Mass houses men in large rooms stacked along a central spine. Three uh, wings used for solitary confinement radiate out from the end of the spine with a panoptic room positioned at their central crossing. And I'm talking here about these three. And then these here are the male dorm units. And over here is female and boys, girls. When I went to Pearsall, it was all male. So they had transformed the use of the western half. Um, but there's something very interesting about this architectural plan, um, which is us thinking through for a moment, embedding the federal courthouse and the health services, which are in blue, which here are other government owned, meaning not ICE, right? So ICE is not involved in, in adjudicating and in, in managing and writing out policy for these spaces. So what does it mean to have a federal courthouse, for example, um, embedded in a privately run prison managed by GeoGroup or ICE. What does that mean in terms of autonomy, transparency, accessibility for how that building you know, functions? Um, this, is not, this is an innovation in this particular building type. There's only obviously so much we can glean from a footprint or a bird's eye view or a plan. Due to this, I conducted a series of cognitive drawing exercises with previously detained persons regarding their experiences in Pearsall. So here is the drawing of Miguel. He's an asylum seeker from Panama. And you can see here his journey. Um, detention was one point along the journey, which is illustrated here. Um, he was actually a musician. And according to him, he fled because of extortion. And uh, when he got to Mexico, he had run-ins with the Zeta. That's what he illustrated here. He went across the US-Mexico border and was applying for asylum, found border patrol, turned himself in, and to his shock, um, was incarcerated for four months. He won asylum 
he, it was found that his claims were credible, and he is now free you know, and, and legal and living in Utah um, with the memory and experience of having been incarcerated by the government that has now given him, him that right for, for four months. So he also drew the pod. So I showed you that photograph of the caged recreational space. That photograph that I showed you was this wall right here, right? With the fencing here and the parking lot here to enter into Pearsall, where we took the photograph of ourselves here. So Miguel explained to me that the pod, each of those pods that were stacked along that spine, house 100 persons each, persons from all over the world. So there's multiple languages happening. There were two televisions alongside um, continuous long tables here. Um, and then this is the caged rec space. This little space here is a multi-purpose room that can be used for prayer or for punishment, you know, for all kinds of different things. Um, and this is where security sat. The bathroom here doesn't have a full wall. It's not a separate room. So security and the other men, including a female security, could see people going to the bathroom, which was something that he expressed, making him very uncomfortable. So it was through him drawing this that I got a, a little bit of, sen of a sense from him of the, the intense claustrophobia. Because unlike the photos I showed you of El Paso and Port Isabel, where there was a mess hall, a recreational outdoor space, dormitory rooms and bathrooms, here everything happens in the pod. So they live in the pod basically 24 seven um, and have their rec time and their meal time and bathroom time together. Uh, this is another map um, of somebody who came from Somalia and had an incredibly long journey. I've met many people with absolutely extraordinary stories, um, many of whom who've traveled through the Americas to get up to the United States. Um, and again, he had similar stories about the experience at Pearsall in terms of um, the many beds uh, that housed the different uh, persons in the pods, up to 100 persons each. Liban notes, I never knew people can be detained for such a long time. I've been there for seven months for something I don't understand. One of the things in these drawing exercises that became very clear to me was that one of the most difficult, and this is something that other people who write about detention have also uh, talked about, one of the things that's the most dis difficult for migrants who are detained is that there's no, it's not a, they're not doing time for a time that they're told. It's an unknown quantity of time. They don't know when they're going to be released. So it can be one month, it can be four years. Uh, we were just talking, Carl and I, with someone at lunch who knows someone who was detained for a year and a half. This is an incredibly long time to be in an unknown process, especially if you're in, a, in an asylum process waiting to figure out you know, if you're going to be given permission to stay or if you're going to be flown back to the place that you're fleeing from. Um, this was an interesting story uh, and, and the last one, um, Ahmed's story, because he talked about the, the arrows and the dates were all of him talking about his experience being t thrown into solitary confinement or segregation. And one of the things that the ACLU and different watchdog groups who have been writing about immigrant detention have been talking about is the, is the arbitrary use of segregation units and solitary confinement. And one of the things that's happening is when these facilities have too much capacity, have an overflow, have too many persons staying in them, they're using the beds in solitary, not because persons are doing anything wrong and need to be punished and moved there, but simply because they see them as extra beds. Because of the damning psychological effects of being in segregation, this is an absolute violation of all rights imaginable. And it's something that's very much happening and happened to him. And it was something that he found incredibly confusing, right? He didn't understand why he had been put in there. You can't see the people's lives and stories from the bird's eye view, but we can get a sense of the scale. Most of the facilities that are built today are 1,000 persons or more. A lot of the car facilities that are built are 2,000 persons or more. And we know it's private prison corporations, construction companies, and ICE that are at the helm of the system, defined by rural siting, inhumane scales, temporary building materials, punitive design, and management. So from two facilities in Texas in the 1960s to multiple facilities today, the fast production of hardened detention space has in turn created its own crisis of detention. Detention design facilities um, you know, incur physical and psychological abuses. 
corporate strategies and government officials working with architects, engineers, and construction firms have worked for years to perfect these spaces. The government has granted corporations broad powers to make decisions about where to locate centers and how to house detainees. And as a result, the private prison uh, construction companies and management companies are not merely implementing the US political agenda, they are also shaping it. So in my final minute, as I conclude, I just want to return to the title of my talk, where I borrow Del Upton's frame, The Spatial Imagination, as a way of thinking through what the relationships are and should be between persons and their environments in specific historic contexts. In this case, we need to think through the relationship between people, the environment, and immigration policy. And we need to work against the work that the existing landscape does on individual and collective understandings of prisons as the status quo for enacting immigration policy. In turning to these buildings and learning about them, we hopefully take, te take steps towards their undoing, towards engaging the possibility of imagining alternative solutions for enforcing immigration law and policy. And I'll end there, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, can I turn this off or I keep it on? It if okay. No. I'll pass the mic around if anybody has questions. Just for the recording. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for that talk, actually. It was just in reference to your, your book. Mm -hmm. um, like, and I don't know who the audience is going to be. And they'll probably be a sort of multivalent audience. But I was really happy that you showed even this image right here of just the, the plans or the site plans. And you had diagrams and things like that, or things that I, for better or for worse, like as an architect, can really relate to. And I appreciate. So thank you for that. Um, and in relation to that, another thing that you sort of touched on was this maybe RFP or the, the thing that put out by the by the government in terms of like their interest in design. Mm -hmm. And I can't like I can't help but think of that sort of the inscription, the Arbeit macht frei, and the issue of like uh, incarceration and labor mm -hmm. and then also some sort of rehabilitation or correction. Um, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about in those and I know you said they're sort of public information, but is there a, a sort of like a mission towards that in, in, ter in terms of like, a, like if you could say a design philosophy? Because the idea of correction, I mean, there's dubious criminality here in terms of the people who are, who are staying in the, or forced to stay in these facilities. So I just wonder, is that something that's included into a mission statement for yeah. design? I would love to find a governmental mission statement that, um, <laughs> that, that outlined what INS, you know, then uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, thought that the the kind of intention behind certain design decisions should be for the purposes of implementing a, a specific kind of immigration policy. The only guidelines from from that more detailed uh, contracts that I've been able to find. Um, have been specifically about material construction and basic programmatic use, like designing, uh, describing you know, the use of building types. They have not, I have not yet found anything that has been more, maybe even just slightly like philosophical or ideological or explicitly political or whatever in terms of saying, you know, we want these facilities to um, impart a certain message to migrants that they're welcome in the United States. They're not welcome in the United States. They've made a grave mistake. They haven't made, you know, nothing like that. Um, on top of that, the, the documents that I was showing you that do show a little bit about some of the design requirements are from the 1950s, right? Those kind of construction bid documents. The one from 2007, um, the more recent one that is ICE, um, also very much doesn't even remotely approach that kind of discussion. Um, so it's very technical. In some of the Freedom of Information Act requests, if you go to the FOIA library website and you look for contracts um, that different facilities have had with the government, there are a few that are available that you can get online. And there are also, um, if you go to ICE's website, there are also guidelines and specifications of what detention centers are supposed to have and not have. So. If, I'm, if my memory services me correctly, for example, 
a detention center has to have a space of prayer, right? So if you look at ICE guidelines, it'll say, you know, there has to be a place where people are able to pray. But then the question is, because we don't have plans available to us, Geo Group and Core Civic won't give us plans, and even persons who are legal advocates and activists are finding that they have limited access to these facilities, we don't know in practice really how that's playing out. Um, so there's, I would love, I wish I, I, I knew more about, about what the kind of um, ideas were behind what these buildings are supposed to be doing. The only thing I can tell is that it's um, a very punitive environment under the sort of auspice of being an economical solution to basically warehousing multiple people. Uh, thanks for that um, great talk. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more towards the relationship that you're drawing between uh, sp uh, Upton's spatial imagination and the place of the cognitive maps yeah. uh, in your methodology. I kept thinking of, um, of Mar well, I guess just a month ago, the, the kind of um, duality be the, or the contrast between uh, Kristen Nelson's um, congressional uh, uh, questioning and that sort of semantic uh, argument about what is a cage and what is not a cage uh, occurring mm. at the same time as the Raices South by Southwest uh, exhibit on the Yelera. Yeah, were um, you there? I was not there, but oh. Instagram. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but it, for me, like I see those as sort of competing forms of of um, mapping, right? Of yeah. Sort of co co contrasting maps, or yeah. or uh, speaking to the kind of tension between availability or holding back of these sort of spatial uh, uh, formations yeah. or abstractions. And it seemed to me that one of the things that you were arguing, uh, well, up, I mean, Upton's spatial imagination is both the fraction of space by class and et cetera. There's also the simultaneous uh, sort of um, making opaque or, or complication of these kind of top-down mm -hmm. uh, imagination. So it seems to me, uh, I guess the question is, what role do these cognitive maps play in your work? Is mm -hmm. it a form of, of a kind of contestatory uh, spatial or mapping practice? Does it yeah. inscribe a different way of understanding movement and stasis? Mm -hmm. Can, I just, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to yeah. know a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm still in the throes of figuring out almost as a practice what, uh, what role the mapping exercises play, partially because the mapping exercises are very hard to do. Um, they are hard to do for the mappers. And so when I initially started this project, I was using it almost as a mechanism um, to respond to a lack of other primary sources. So I was using it almost as more of a logistical or strategical move than a, than a conceptual uh, one. But as I started to continue to do the exercises, and when I first started, I did them with my students. Um, I've done them since then on my own. It's clear to me that they've taken on a life of their own, um, and that very much as you say, it is about visibility, it is about storytelling, um, it is about the spatial and the social being one and the same, as many have said. So for the people who are telling these stories, they are making that space visible to me. And as they're doing that, they're making their experiences present and a part of this kind of larger historic narrative. Um, where I go from here with the mappings, you know, I, I think in many ways uh, the question is, what sources of information do we need to be able to understand how fragile something that seems so permanent actually is. What stories can help us get there? So I think that the cognitive mapping is kind of one source for that. Um, when you realize that the thing that animates these buildings is only the persons who are detained in them, you take those persons away and they become shells that can be 
that, that lose that kind that lose the meaning and the potency that they currently have. But I mean, the the amount of work that ICE is doing to keep those stories from reaching the broader public is just enormous. So in some ways, it's like um, I'm thinking a little bit. It's not at all the same. But I'm thinking a little bit of the forensic architecture book uh, in terms of of just coming up with alternative strategies for understanding sites that are basically closed off to public knowledge and public access. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, what's your take on when you were told that uh, how does architecture punish is not the right way to phrase it kind of thing? Because um, that came up. A couple of years ago, we had a symposium, and uh, a Princeton architecture historian, PhD student, actually, I think, yeah. uh, Megan Earsley, she was yeah. doing research. Yeah, yeah, she's doing research on uh, South Africa and mm -hmm. how this kind of um, local population was shaped into these kind of newer bodies to kind of deal with the sort of this. Uh, incredible conditions of mining and you know like getting used to heat and mm -hmm. and then she sort of had this kind of very kind of specific she kind of documented you know these kind of specific ways of you know how they were kind of their bodies were conditioned and how they were deformed with time and things like that mm -hmm. I just wonder whether like in this case uh, whether that could be like how what kind of bodily kind of evidence could be recovered you know from mm -hmm. these um, like one thing that comes to mind is here, you know, because we have a pretty good sort of this resettlement infrastructure in Buffalo, something yeah. that they, every time that, you know, these kind of issues come up is this sort of, you know, this kind of trauma in uh, trauma informed approaches, da da da. And they're sort of very much in tune with also our, you know, the School of Social Work here. It's kind of, they're very sort of in tune with this kind of the mental state of the refugees who are resettled mm -hmm. here and things like that. Mm -hmm. I just wonder whether like there are these kind of, um, some sort of a agency or something like that that's kind of collecting that kind of data, mm -hmm. uh, sort of you know aggregating that kind of data to kind of see like what kind of impact that mm -hmm. these facilities are sort of inducing mm -hmm. on the inmates. You know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah. kind of as an in sort of evidence of like that's uh, as a form of punishment. Yeah, yeah. I have different thoughts. Um, one thing you know when uh, when I read about social work. Um, that focuses on psychological trauma, I, it is very useful and it's very interesting um, to triangulate with what you see when you look at the facilities or learn about policy or different aspects. But when you ask somebody to tell you what the spaces of their pod looked like, a whole different set of stories about their psychological experience that may or may not be traumatic come out that are often absent in the s narratives that are told when you're when you're focusing on what their migration story is, why they left, um, what their social experience is, are they feeling oppressed, are they feeling happy? It's a it's a whole different set of stories. So, for example, um, through the mapping exercises, one person that I was talking to explained to me that for him the problem of having only the caged recreational space is that you couldn't see the sky or grass. You know, you couldn't, you didn't, you, you never had a sense of just being in the world beyond the world that became your, your life. And then he said there was a drain hole that if you crouched down to, you know, to the bottom of the wall, there was a little drain hole that if you peered through it, you could see the grass. And he would find himself you know, crouching there and peering through it to basically recapture a sense of, of stability and balance because he was feeling so um, unstable. And so that's the kind of thing where, you know, I wasn't asking him to tell me about what the hardest moments for the day were. I was asking him to just describe the space so that I could get a sense of, of what this place that I wasn't being allowed to enter looked like, right? And what this experience was like um, for the people that were in there. And it was stories like that that came out. Uh, another one, the other, uh, the man who drew uh, from Panama, the, uh, the musician, when he was drawing his map and he was explaining, um, so it's you know bunk beds and it's about 50 persons along each wall, 
Um, and then he was drawing numbers. Uh, it was a E A P G P four, and I, you know, what is that? Those are the bank, bank, uh, bunk numbers, and that's what they called us. They didn't call you by your name, no, right? So if he, if someone got a letter in the mail, or if someone needed to talk to a facilities uh, officer, they would say G four, mm -hmm. right? And that was your bunk number. So there started to be a kind of association with the material environment and the subjectivity of the person. And then the other thing he explained to me um, was that after a certain period of time, finally that they would build friendships. He would build friendships with maybe someone above or below him or, or in the room who spoke Spanish. Um, and what would happen is they would reshuffle the pods. And that this happened to him, and he drew out on that map the number of different pods he stayed in, and it was something like five you know, different pods. So every time that there was a sense of kind of fraternity growing in, in the pod, then ICE would, would reshuffle, or, or the, the geo group, whoever was, was managing the facility would reshuffle. And so it's these kind of spatial ways of, of breaking down friendship, solidarity, and bonds. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that you know, there are different ways that we can think about how architecture, in combination, of course, in that case with management, um, punishes. The other thing I would say is, so one is telling the micro stories of the experience of being in certain environments at, at that level of a room, you know, or a part of a room. But then at the more macro level, for me, it's the whole system that, that a building puts into place, because the building comes with contracts, and those contracts have multi-year outlooks, and it comes with you know, um, maintenance, and it, not just maintenance of the building, but of the employees. So once you start to build up the material infrastructure of detention, it punishes because it reinforces its own logic that detention is a solution and a viable solution for immigration policy. Detention actually doesn't have to be the solution that we use for people who are in a process of trying to figure out if they can stay in the United States or if, they can, if they're going to leave. Um, Carl and I were talking earlier. A lot of immigration lawyers that I've spoken to talk about how 90% of persons who have representation who are in a process of waiting for asylum show up for their court hearing. They don't abscond. So there could be an alternative universe where migrants had legal representation and were in the communities instead of in detention and would still show up for their court cases to then find out sort of what the actual you know, process is. Yeah. So, so it is an interesting question. You know, does architecture punish? And then also, at what scale? Right. You know, are we talking about the wall, the lack of a window? Are we talking about the material system and its related effects? And I, it's one that I'm still very much searching for ways to study and think about. Right. I mean, it's kind of nested, no? Like even the sort of the rural placement of these and everything mm -hmm. kind of all sort of adds up. Yeah, yeah, right. Just the location alone, and that's something that that the geographers, you know, have done excellent work studying specifically how location and geography, intrastate. Uh, migrants who are have families and communities and who are detained in here in Buffalo in New York and then they'll be taken to Texas facilities mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden no one can, they can't have any visitation and the social fabric erodes mm -hmm. so geography is a huge part you know of, of how punishment is happening mm -hmm. um. So thank you. That was a really, really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about um, the temporary buildings and mm -hmm. structures. And so, you know, you started off with an early image of the sort of tents that are popping up. And I remember sort of news stories of like, oh, this has gotten even worse because now there's temporary structures. And so I was wondering if you know, like, who who is putting those up and who is controlling those spaces and what is the relationship between that and the more permanent buildings? Um, yeah. And if you see those related or feeding into each other, what? The only one um, that I know a little bit about specifically is Willacy, uh, if I'm getting that right, in, in Austin. It's um, Kevlar tents. 
they're they're po they're not pods like what they call the detention pods in Pearsall, but they're pods uh, with 200 persons per tent. Um, so that one is is a company called Sprung. They're based in Utah, and if you look on their, I haven't been able to talk to anyone at that company, um, but. If you look on their website, they do design solutions for weddings, international conferences, prisons. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like any temporary, you know, that's any temporary facility that you need and sp will sprung from your, you know, sprung. Um, so so they, they specialize, it's, it's basically this technocratic, they specialize in the technological and they're not worried about the social application. Um, Willacy, um, it was, it's one of these unique facilities in Texas that, that both has existed as a criminal alien requirement facility, um, so the BOP, and as a detention center for ICE. A lot of the temporary um, um, places become kind of permanent, right? So they, they're temporary, and then it's five years, and there they are. Um, and so another interesting place that to me has a kind of temporary feeling to it is Dilly, which is trailer homes. And again, Dilly, it seems as though it, 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 it's a kind of unplanned small town at this point. Um, and it keeps kind of growing larger and larger. And that's the, the family facility that's about an hour and something outside of Austin. So, but those facilities, even though Sprung uh, built Willacy, they're still managed by the private prison corporations. You know, there's not, there's not a whole separate system for them. There's still ICE and then, you know, ICE working with one of the many, you know, whether it's Core Civic or Geo Group or Emerald, yeah. But there, there's a lot that's been written on those facilities as being highly problematic architecturally, because they're because they get because they're not built as permanent facilities. They meet no require. I mean, they have no heating and ventilation systems, the sewage systems. There's not even a pretense for natural lighting. I mean, there's so many things about them that are they are what they look like. They're tents. Um, so that that has definitely been being it's contested on the ground all the time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, a wonderful talk. Um, I, one of the things that might be interesting to look at is uh, similar, like large scale, these material systems that gather sort of a momentum that then dissipate. So, one historical example I'd be interested in thinking about the parallels or possible parallels would be like uh, mental asylum mm -hmm. uh, facilities mm -hmm. and sort of their build up and large scale, but then ultimately a sort of very swift end, at least in California where I'm mm -hmm. from. Um, I have a couple questions. One is uh, the role of technology in the change uh, in the design of these mm -hmm. places. I mean, are they high tech facilities of any sort? Uh, what role has technology played in the in their siting and their operations uh, and the practices? Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing I was wondering if you've ever considered. Um, you see a lot of these images of these in press in the press within mm -hmm. like New York Times or CNN. Uh, have you ever thought of doing sort of like a critical study of the media representations of these facilities and the oh. way that those images, you yeah. know, already almost like pre-criminalize yeah. the, the people in them? Right. Yeah. The technology, um, I've only, um, the, the facilities that I've been into have seemed high tech to me, but I also have a flip phone. <laughs> So, <laughs> full disclosure, um, you know, I mean, they've seemed high tech in the sense that they have, you know, surve full surveillance. Their their use of cameras is incredibly heavy. They're all you, you're beeped in and out of doors that are automatic. So it's it's not a building that is a normal person functioning building. It has like another layer of kind of automated functioning. Um, what they call the Sally Port is where you know persons are dropped off in secure zones outside of the building and go through the Sally Port into the building. So those are also very highly securitized um, interstitial inside outside spaces. Um, but you know, and then they've got like the video visitation. They're increasingly doing court cases by video, which is helping for the asylum rates to just 
plummet because you know not having a judge in front of a person who's trying to tell them and have a credible fear interview or greatly decreases the extent to which the judge perceives the person. Um, so, so technology is is on the rise. Um, but then, when but then the actual rooms where the that I've seen where the persons are detained are pretty, you know, just bolted furniture, just like the pictures you've seen of of prisons. You know, they're pretty basic um, structure, pretty basic furniture, uh, metal, um, all very kind of indestructible. Um, no glass, no mirrors, no things that could be used. You know, as in in any kind of um, alternative use. Um, so, and then in terms of doing a reading of, of the representations, that would be fascinating. I, I, I hope someone is doing that. I wonder if someone is doing that. I feel like someone in some field should be doing that. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's my field, um, but, uh, but definitely, you know, one of the things that really, frustrates me is my own opinion of course has greatly changed as I've done this research you know what I thought in, in before I started this research it keeps evolving as I learn more and more um, but, but when you see these images on the media of these SID detention centers or these tent cities as the status quo as the place where migrants are detained of course it collapses in our minds this criminalization of the migrant immediately into this realized material artifact. So it makes this very easy association of, oh right, because you're a criminal. That's why you're in a green jumper or orange jumper or blue jumper. That's why you're staying in that facility, because you're a criminal. And it takes a, a lot of work and, and learning and unpeeling of how that moment happens to, to realize what is happening and to whom and know they're not criminals. Um, and yes, they're being treated like criminals. And yes, they're housed in buildings that look like prisons and function like prisons. And it's like, it's like a mental, you know, it's like a, a mental exercise that kind of has to continue on as, for me, as I, as I continually see these images and learn the stories and learn the history and try to triangulate it all and understand how we got here. So I hope you should do it. <laughs> Yeah. The people who run these places? Yeah. Uh, the people who run these places? Yeah. You mean Geo Group yeah. and Civic and? Yeah, I mean, well, I was thinking about all these facilities have staff, right? Yeah. All of these facilities have staff, right? Yeah. Uh, so are they evident? Are they lots of people or very few people? Do they live on site? Do they? Are they invisible? I have your camera comment? You know, most of the people, um, I have not read, um, I'm trying to think if Bosworth, who does ethnographic work about detention centers, she does, I think, talk to employees more. Um, one employee that I met who worked at a county facility, so one of the few publicly run facilities, uh, not, not by one of these corporations, um, for example, told me that a lot of people who worked at that facility commuted in, right? So they don't necessarily live in that community of 4,000, 5,000 persons. They're commuting in maybe an hour, an hour and a half from somewhere nearby. Um, I think one of the reasons that facilities go into some of these more rural locations is because they promise the local politicians jobs. And indeed, also, there are very young, generally men, working at the facilities who are from the community. Um, Dilly is an example where the, you know, there is a community nearby to the facility. The facility has 2,500 people, so they have a lot of employees, um, including pooling from, from the city itself, this town, small town. But I don't know, you know that's, that's one of the layers of the story that I haven't had access to, um, is people who work there talking to me and, and you know, sharing with me what their perspective and experience is um, as employers. I mean, I was also prompted to ask by images like this where the facilities that you show seem very isolated. Yeah. Intentionally, it was a bit Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, absolutely, they are isolated, that, which has been a, a problem for finding the labor to build them. 
So a lot of labor to build the facilities also is off-site, is, is being recruited from urban centers, and mm -hmm. people are, you know, both materials and people are driving in to construct the facilities themselves. And, but yeah, I mean, the point is that these are in very remote locations, um, and staffing is not, staffing is, is not easy. Mm -hmm. It's a problem for, for the corporations. And the people that I've seen working there are young. They're very young, you know, in their 20s. So. Thank you. Thanks again, Sarah, for Thanks. everything. Um, and let me just ask this. This is a sort of follow up on that same question. I think you kind of alluded to it. A lot of what we uh, imagine that the immigration system is set up to do now is to deter immigration. Um, and uh, and 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 cut down the amount of basically black and brown people in the United States who are more likely to vote Democratic. Okay, so this is this is a, certainly something we we think of a lot when we think about the the reasons for the immigration policies that we have today. To what extent could this rural isolation make it harder, as you pointed out, for people to get the legal help they need to actually? succeed in staying mm -hmm. are these essentially pre-deportation right centers yeah so raices which is an organization in san antonio mm -hmm. and grassroots leadership which is has one of their offices in um austin um have have tried to really highlight that issue mm -hmm. they work with immigration lawyers and they try to connect detained persons with legal representation. And they try to fight contracts for new facilities, and they try to close down existing facilities that exist in these locations that are too far for their networks to reach. And so basically, once you get more than 20 miles, I mean, I, you know, everyone has their range, but you have to think of this is pro bono legal advocacy. So these are lawyers who are doing this work and not being paid for it or being paid nominal fees. And having to pay for the gas. And having to pay for the gas. How much time out of their day, out of their schedule, can they take to go meet their client? Mm -hmm. So it geographically, that really restricts the, the extent to which the, the facility can be you know, far from a city. So absolutely, one of the things that Grassroots um, has done is they've tried to keep track. OK, where are all the pro, bo pro bono legal advocates in Texas? Where are they located? Right? Who, and they try to have them on, online and available and create a coalition. Um, and that's where I got the, the numbers of the distance of miles was by locating where those pro bono lawyers are, where the detention centers are, and saying, OK, on average, we're talking 100 miles for a detention center, and we're talking on average 200 miles for a car facility. Right? So basically, you're eliminating the, op the option of representation, at least in-person representation, if, if you're located in a car facility. Yeah. Yeah. Have you talked to any of the lawyers to get, they clearly had access to the facilities or not? They do unevenly. I, I have talked to lawyers. Um, there's a, Denise Gilman is an amazing um, immigration lawyer who does a lot of work in Texas. Uh, she also teaches at UT. Um, and her, as far as I you know, remember her telling me, her access has been something that she's always afraid of losing. Um, a lot of people who work with Raices and Grassroots, I briefly did a, um, a visitation program with Grassroots Leadership, and it, you never know if you're going to get access. They, they refer to it as being blacklisted. But basically, ICE can put your name on a list that, so when you go to the facility, they just say, sorry, you can't go in, and they don't tell you why. And what I've heard is that you know, activists and advocates increasingly aren't allowed in the facilities. So you know, legal representation, of course, is absolutely supposed to be allowed into the facilities. And if, if they go and if they're meeting their client, then you know, that, that sh is supposed to happen. Um, if that is always happening in every facility, every time the door is knocked, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, it's not a cheerier talk. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Should we give Sarah a big round of applause? Thank you. Talk?